me to speak with the group about what it means to attain the rank of full professor at the University of Toronto. And as I scan the room, I don't know all of you, but I know many of you, and there are some full professors here. Um, so this is something that you're well aware of, but I still think it's worth acknowledging what it means for you to have attained this rank. And all I can say is I think it's a pretty big deal and very well deserved on your part. Um, promotion of full professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine and in the Faculty of Medicine um, is difficult to attain. The uh, U of T sets a very high bar, and it's a bar that's pretty different from other universities in Canada. Um, in our department, uh, you know, we're not yet 50 years old, we're about 45 years old, and it's just in more recent years that we're starting to see more and more full professors. So currently, and this would look very different, say, from the Department of Medicine or Surgery or Psychiatry, but I'm still proud of the fact that at this point, we have 20 full professors, and then we have nine individuals who hold the rank of Professor Emeritus. Um, we have over 1,400 faculty, but many of them are um, adjunct um, faculty who are in community-based sites. They're very, very important clinician teachers for our department. Um, but it means that our overall percentages look different from other departments. So as many of you know, in assessing a candidate for promotion to full professor, U of T looks at academic achievements in areas such as research, creative professional activity. You're looking pained, aren't you, Howard? I could have you put that uh, um, application together, teaching, and more importantly, and I think you'd agree for our students and for the patients that we serve. Um, I'm going to leave it to Eric to talk to you about Howard's specific accomplishments. I'd just like to say on a personal level, I'm really proud to be your colleague. You know, I'm impressed with your clinical achievements, you as a leader, your academic achievements, but I'm really impressed by the way in which you approach difficult situations, the way you treat colleagues, everybody. And I, I think maybe that's the thing that distinguishes you most of all. So to be a full professor and to be the person that you are to me is a pretty remarkable accomplishment. So congratulations, Professor Bucks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. The story is told of the Jewish senator who runs for president and is elected to everybody's surprise. And um, so the president elect calls his mother in New Jersey and says, Mom, I want you to come to the inauguration ceremony in Washington, D.C. And she says, God, and she lives in California, she said, go all the way to New Jersey, I, it'll be a cramped air flight, it'll be she says, Ma, he says, Ma, I'll buy you a first class ticket. I'm the president. I'll send the Air Force One for you. She says, yeah, but I'll have to buy a new dress. She says, Ma, I'll get the finest dressmaker in Washington to make you a dress. She says, yeah, but they'll probably serve pork. <laughs> she says, Ma, he said, Ma, I'll get you the finest kosher restaurant in the Northeast to make you a special meal. She decides to come. She comes to the inauguration, and she happens to sit next to the Secretary of State, Ben Water. She sits next to the Secretary of State. During the speech, the Secretary of State leans over and says, so, you must be very proud. She says, of course I'm proud. His brother's an emergency physician. <laughs> I'd like to review some of the highlights of Howard's academic career and the significance of his academic contributions. And I think that I'm probably in a better position than any of anyone else in this room to do so, besides his mother. <laughs> In 1981, I was practicing as an emergency physician in the emergency department with Claire Murphy. I'm now in Salome in 1981. And uh, it was at that time that we had a novel idea, we had a radical idea that we were going to hire some extra people so we could actually have an emergency physician working on nights as well. Because I thought we just had interns working on nights. The radical idea, the radical concept that we were going to have full time emergency physicians working after midnight as well. 
So we decided to expand our pool so we could get him covered in the department full time and we were able to recruit Howard who started in 1982. And he's been the mainstay at SINE ever since. And he's been the director of emergency services since 1997. In his 32 year career, Howard has developed a national and in fact an international reputation. First of all, for being an exceptional clinician. I think everybody in this room has worked with him, students, residents, would attest to that. Secondly, for being an outstanding clinical teacher. He's the recipient of numerous awards for both teaching and excellence in creative professional activity. He's recognized as an outstanding administrator. The Emergency Department of Mount Sinai is widely recognized as a center of excellence in emergency medicine. And Howard has done a remarkable job in recruiting outstanding faculty that is making an essential contribution to the discipline of emergency medicine and to academic emergency medicine both nationally and internationally. And the new Schwartz Reisman Emergency Medicine Institute, the first of its kind in Canada, will serve to further strengthen the reputation of the department. Howard has developed a national reputation for his contribution to the, the profession and to public interest and safety. His work on gun shot wound reporting and gun control began in 2000, and partially because of his efforts and his advocacy, the province of Ontario passed legislation in 2005 mandating public reporting of gunshots, and to date seven other provinces followed Ontario's lead and passed similar legislation. For a great many years, Emergency departments have been faced with issues related to overcrowding and patient access. This is not only a Toronto problem, but a national problem, and in fact an international problem as well. Over the past 10 years, Howard, probably more than any other emergency physician in the country, has been involved on a local and national effort to highlight the issue of overcrowding and help influence the Ontario government to take action with respect to emergency department access and workforce. In his various roles, such as on the Cape Public Affairs Committee, in his role on the OMA section of emergency medicine, Howard has been involved with efforts to raise public and government awareness as to the impact of emergency department overcrowding and its impact on patient care that we can provide on a timely basis. He became the co-chair of the Ontario Emergency Room ALC Expert Panel and subsequently in 2009 became the Provincial Lead for Emergency Medicine for the province of Ontario. In that role, he has become the lead advisor to the government on its emergency department overcrowding strategy and related public policy issues. It is not an overstatement to say that largely due to Howard's leadership and that capacity, the emergency department wait time strategy in the province has been an enormous success. Access to emergency services in Ontario has been greatly enhanced. Wait times to see physicians in our emergency departments and length of stay are greatly reduced. The percentage of patients who leave our emergency department without being seen has been reduced markedly. The Pay for Results program that Ace helped lead has transformed the quality of emergency services in Ontario and made the arguably the best program that's coming in the world. Howard's career on lead time includes many other significant academic contributions and time limitations preclude me from mentioning all of them. But I would like to pick up on something I didn't mention. In addition to Howard's remarkable career as a clinician, educator, administrator, and researcher, and in addition to his enormous contributions to the discipline of emergency medicine and to public policy in Ontario, he has at the same time been an incredible mentor for hundreds of students, residents, and junior faculty, and a wonderful friend and colleague. Finally, it was Albert Einstein who said, that setting an example is not the main means of influencing others. It is the only means. Howard has been an inspiring role model for clinical excellence, academic excellence, and professionalism at the University of Toronto and beyond to countless of trainees and colleagues, and I should say for me personally as well. Howard has made an enormous contribution to academic emergency medicine and to the discipline of emergency medicine nationally and internationally and is most deserving of this distinguished promotion to full promotion.
save some for the end. So uh, thank you, Lynn, so much for that, uh, for, the, for your words, and Eric. Um, people have asked me what it means to be promoted to full professor. Lynn's given you her definition. UrbanDictionary.com tells us <laughs> that full means bloated, <laughs> and professor is a person who thinks they are so much smarter than everyone else, or a nerd with a giant ego. So in common usage, a prof professorial address would be a bloated speech by an arrogant nerd. <laughs> However, a more formal explanation for the professorial address is that it is part scholarly dissertation on some aspect of your career, part thank you and acknowledgement, and ideally is both interesting and funny. I did aspire to the latter formulation. My first draft was a bit bloated, and funny story, I had put aside some time yesterday and today to edit and cut down my comments, but I got kind of busy. So it's going to take me a while. <laughs> so get comfortable. But don't fear, I brought a few articles that will help us. So first of all, water, for me or for you, if, if you get thirsty, we can share. Uh, secondly, uh, some Kleenex. I don't think I'll get verklempt, but some of my stories are very touching. If you need Kleenex, help yourself, don't be shy. And finally, I know some of you won't admit it, but there are people here who are eyeing their neighbors nervously, wondering what you did today. If you feel the need, go for it. I want everybody to be comfortable. My own first experience in an emergency department was as an elective student in December 1977 at the old Toronto General Hospital. They had a new director then, just arrived from Montreal, Bruce Rowett, one of my mentors. And actually, I thought he was going to be here today, but I don't see him. Uh, but back then, Bruce asked us to call him the Hawk and he wore a red lab coat for Christmas. He made emergency medicine fun. But among my, my memories of that month was that even though in those days TGH was the flagship emergency department for downtown Toronto, it was generally quiet. So quiet that the students and interns could sit around in a room waiting for patients to see, like car salesmen waiting for their turn to be up. Um, life was very different in emergency medicine then. As you heard, often staff supervision was only available for part of the day. After hours, the interns saw the patients alone, but the nurses tried to ensure the damage they did was limited <laughs> by enforcing policies like, Allison can fill some of the blanks in, every chest pain should see medicine, every suicidal patient should see psych, and every vaginal bleed should see gynae. However, we didn't have a pregnancy test with any reliability. Ultrasound was only done transabdominally, so we could not diagnose early ectopic pregnancies. Cardiac markers, telltale signs uh, in your blood that a patient is having a heart attack, were nonspecific, and the lab only ran them once daily. Back then, we'd have been delighted to have any troponin at all, even a rude or insensitive one. Sort of an inside joke. The emergency physicians will explain it later. Blood clots in the lung were diagnosed by pulmonary angiograms, which were far from benign. Leg clots were diagnosed by venograms, a horrible test, which caused a lot of clots themselves, but also required intravenous access in what was, by definition, a swollen, inflamed leg. Not easy. There were no MRIs, no D-dimers or BNPs. There were no magical drugs like propofol, midazolam, or fentanyl. No oxygen saturation monitors. So, armed with Demerol and Valium, and the opportunity to do a painful procedure, we could usually accomplish a hypoxia without any obvious pain relief. <laughs> but one thing we had was lots of beds. We routinely admitted patients for workup of things like abdominal pain, and the standard series of tests, many of which some of you will have never encountered, included a barium swallow, followed by a barium enema, an IVP, and an ultrasound. This would take about five days, 
and gave us less useful information than a CT scan today can in under five hours. EM practice was risky and we experienced lots of misdiagnoses and bad outcomes. Today we practice much differently, rapidly diagnosing and treating a host of conditions, usually safely, non-invasively, and often without the need for admission. We can perform a wide range of procedures safely and comfortably. We, we do things we would have thought impossible back then. But in some important ways, our practice has not changed. The human element, the need for communication and compassion is timeless. This need was beautifully demonstrated by my favorite emergency medicine publication of all time. It's a bit obscure and is either unknown or forgotten by most of us. But it was written by a Uni University of Toronto internist, many of you know, Don Redelmeyer, and was published in that once prestigious journal, The Lancet, in 1995. It carried the ironic title, A Randomized Trial of Compassionate Care for the Homeless in an Emergency Department. In a historic note, the trial was carried out in an emergency department that no longer exists, the Wellesley. We'll come back to the restructuring commission that closed the Wellesley in a bit. Don's research question was essentially, if we're nice to people, will they be more or less likely to come back? He performed the study to counter the perception in many minds back then that if we were too nice to the patients, it would be counterproductive and we would only encourage them. The data, in fact, showed fewer repeat visits from patients who had been randomized to have a trained volunteer basically be nice to them while their care took place. And the intervention was blinded for patients and staff. Don speculated that the outcome might be explained by the idea that patients return to the ED repeatedly until they have their needs met. That is, their need for some human connection and understanding. I was asked in the late 80s to give a talk to the annual meeting of our hospital volunteers on the role of the ED. With your indulgence, I'd like to read an excerpt from it. We provide care to 25,000 patients a year. We're up to 60,000 now. Whether on Yom Kippur or Christmas, in blizzards and blackouts, 24 hours a day, every day, we're open, a claim we can share with other essential service providers, such as Franz and Tim Hortons. <laughs> we provide medical care to everything from the trivial to the tragic, attending to the immediate care of life and limb threatening injury and illness, as well as the walking wounded and worried well. We provide the only tenuous link to the healthcare system for the lonely, the depressed, and the flotsam and jetsam of society. After midnight, we're a drop-in center for the young and the restless, the distressed and the drug and alcohol intoxicated. We're the one healthcare service that never turns anyone away. We provide shelter to the homeless on cold winter nights, safety for battered women, and food for the hungry. ER staff are dedicated, flexible, and enjoy responding to unanticipated challenges. They are all volunteers and that they've made a choice to be there. Together we stress teamwork, we're the front door of the hospital, the safety net of the healthcare system, and the modern day sanctuary of society. A modern day secular sanctuary. A sanctuary is a place of refuge or safety, a place where someone is protected or given shelter. I've always felt this sanctuary role was part of the core mission of the ED one with the potential for great impact in improving lives or at least providing comfort. So the unifying theme of my career has been to practice, teach, and create the conditions that permit and encourage quality and efficient care, but also humane care within the emergency department. Dawn's paper was part of the literature on one of the universal aspects of any emergency department, the frequent flyer or repeat visitor. The term frequent flyer was never pejorative to me. It's a bit sarcastic, we don't seek or reward repeat business, but we do become familiar with these people, sometimes fond of them, and when emerged docs and nurses get together, we often trade stories about these characters. Jerry deserves a front seat. We've got courtside seats. Alan deserves a front seat too. Alan, show Jerry to his seat. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to be able to say to them, and you can tell them that I, I had, this time I had courtside seats for them. So I saw a memorable character, a frequent flyer, over 20 years ago. 
She claimed she'd been struck by a taxi in Manhattan and had injured her spleen. And having no insurance, she'd left the hospital against medical advice and took a bus back to Toronto, came straight from the bus terminal over to our ER. She was pale, her heart was racing, and she needed a lot of attention and pain medication until we could sort things out. But neither her story nor her injuries could be validated. I kind of forgot about her a bit, but over the next few weeks, at least four or five different colleagues independently came up to me and said they had a great story to share, and it was the exact same story from different emergency departments around Toronto. Stories like her were on my mind when I developed an ongoing research interest in finding more, out, more about these patients learning how to, and learning how to manage, manage them better. We found in general that these people have severe mixed medical, social and economic problems, often mental health and or substance abuse issues as well. They require a coordinated approach in and out of our departments. They challenge our system and services. They ask us, how do we treat our most vulnerable? Most recently, an innovation grant has allowed us to partner with our psychiatry colleagues, some of whom are here tonight, to create a team to create individual care plans to guide our staff in how to manage these often challenging patients. And today we have over 300 active care plans on file. Patient outcomes have in fact been variable, but the plans have shown to lead to better use of resources and our staff feel better supported. Speaking of the most vulnerable, most of you will not know the story, but will, will not know the name, but recognize the story of Brian Sinclair. Poor Mr. Sinclair, an Aboriginal man in double amputee, with med multiple medical and social problems, has truly become the poster boy for ED overcrowding. A tragic story that's been told many times. Yet in the six years since he died unattended, after sitting quietly in a Winnipeg emergency department waiting room for 36 hours waiting for care, many still draw the wrong lessons. Attention is focused on the hospital staff who were on duty at the time, and while every individual staff member who was on duty in the vicinity of that waiting room does have to account for their decisions, his experience crossed at least three shifts, and Winnipeg still has some of the worst waiting times in the country today. What that tells me is that the waiting room was out of control, the staff were frustrated, morale was low, and a case like that of Mr. Sinclair was a tragedy waiting to happen. The failure of access to the ED that is described as a systemic failure that hospitals and governments also have to be accountable for. And while we can question the decisions of the staff, we also have to be amazed that they show up for work in an environment like that at all. Come in, Larry, Judy, time out. Time out. We have courtside seats for you, come on up. Brian Seekler may be an extreme example, but you can't have a sanctuary if there is a queue to get in. The most basic aspect of quality for an emergency department is access. Not just for convenience, not just for appearances, but for safety. Multiple large st studies, some of them done by people here, have shown over and over again that when waits are long, risks rise and bad things happen. Not just to those who are waiting, but all fa patients face increased risks, likely as staff cut corners trying to keep up. The fight for better ED access has been a long one, and until we had system changes, we sometimes had to make do with Band-Aid solutions. In the 90s at Mount Sinai, we used a donation from the late Ray Wolf to build a small but lovely unit to house our admitted patients who had no beds, so they wouldn't have to wait in the hallway. As Eric said, as a member of the OMA section of Emergency Medicine Executive, Many of us fought for policy changes to improve ED access for many years. And for the last five years, I have been perhaps the luckiest eMERGE doc in the country, as I've had the pleasure of being the lead advisor to Ontario government on improving ED access and related policy issues. I want to thank Michael Schul for taking a sabbatical, which created the opportunity <laughs> for me to steal his job. And either he's a really gracious do uh, person who doesn't resent it, or he's here today to get even. So if he goes for his, something in his jacket pocket, everybody over here duck. <laughs> it's important in order for me to have influence that I can understand the data, that I know the evidence, that I can quote the literature, but to really move people, you have to tell them the stories. So I always lead off a talk or a briefing on overcrowding 
with some Ontario names. Stella Lacroix, Kyle Martin, Joshua Flewelling, Patricia Viperi, were all patients who died in the context of seeking care from an overcrowded emergency department. And their deaths led, directly in some cases, to system improvements. Stella Lacroix's death, death gave us critical. Kyle Martin's led to the use of the CTAS triage system and triage by registered nurses. Joshua Flewelling's death led to the end of ambulance redirection as a way to, for EDs to control their work workflow. And Patricia Viperi's death contributed to an era of crisis that led to the Bob Bell Report and our overcrowding program. And since that program started in 2008, we have had no such stories in Ontario. Something all of us should be very proud of. But interestingly, the media isn't interested in good news. So I call the silence, the absence of bad stories, the dog that didn't bark. And I hope in Ontario it continues to not bark for a long time to come. Today the media is alive with stories and hype about Ebola. In 2003 it was SARS. I said earlier that ER staff are dedicated, flexible, and enjoy responding to unanticipated challenges. SARS was certainly an unanticipated challenge that we met at Mount Sinai and in other places around Toronto with dedication and our staff demonstrated real courage. In fact, there's at least one person here who got sick with SARS. We cared for over 20 confirmed SARS cases in our ED and with diligence and some help from Alison McGear, who would have been here tonight, but she's actually in Liberia fighting Ebola at ground zero. We came through without any transmission to staff. There was little complaining, no fear-driven absenteeism amongst our frontline staff. It was a bizarre set of coincidences that brought SARS to Toronto, and it was, it was the reputation of Allison and the late great Don Lowe that brought SARS to Mount Sinai. But we took our experience and made it into an opportunity to improve our processes and that of others. And we spoke and published widely on the lessons of SARS for ED design, triage screening, and operations. Today we see the benefits of those efforts. In Ontario we have mandatory triage screening for contagious diseases and the tool we use and the related processes can be easily adjusted for new circumstances. Not just Ebola but seasonal flu, Middle East respiratory syndrome and others. If Texas had this process in place they would not have sent their first Ebola case home. Ebola is a tragedy for Africa but it's really just a distraction for North America. Oven's first rule of SARS was that fear is inversely proportional to risk. And I derived it from my observations that those caring for SARS patients themselves seemed fine. Those removed were anxious, sometimes panicky. The rule continues to hold true right now. Workers in the outbreak zone go about their business, while fear in North America is fanned by those with an interest in fear mongering for personal, political, or commercial gain. Ebola is a story which is still unfolding, but which already is challenging us to learn the right lessons. Among them, certainly the enlightened self-interest in a global community of responding earlier to an outbreak at its source, and the benefits of good practical baseline emergency medicine practice, things like triage screening, universal precautions, and avoidance of crowding. I've talked at some length now about the aspects of my career path. I'd like to say that my career choice or career directions were guided by a personal vision, but I'm truly the accidental emergency physician and the serendipitous professor. You see, I'm not residency trained in emergency medicine. And when Eric says I was recruited, it's quite an exaggeration because the day in 1982 that Claire Murphy hired me, I had actually come to Mount Sinai to apply for a job in family medicine. <laughs> I needed a job. If they'd had one in the switchboard, I'd probably be the supervisor there today. <laughs> I've taken no advanced training in science or research methodology. I don't have an MBA, not even, I, not even a weekend course on leadership. Don't worry, I did attend medical school. I have witnesses, some of them are here. <laughs> but in fact, my lack of credentials is so startling, you'd think my avoidance of achieving them was driven by some grand theory or ideology rather than just the absence of one. But it wasn't. I was just busy. And although I'm not kidding 
about my preference to learn things the hard way, I have often wished I had more formal training. So whenever one of my staff has shown an interest, I've tried to encourage and support them to take that course, get that certificate or degree, travel to that meeting, and overall that has brought, broadened the skills in our team greatly. But my lack of training and credentials does raise the question, how do I account for my success? I'd like to suggest that part of it is related to my ability to tell a good story. Rudyard Kipling said that if history were taught in the form of stories, it would never be forgotten. But today in medicine, we value evidence-based approaches to care, and we deride anecdotal-based decisions and behavior. Stories are, of course, just anecdotes, and certainly we need science and evidence. But we also find often that it's hard to convince our colleagues of needed changes in approach to practice, harder still to convince patients to change their ways. We note the difference between effectiveness and effect efficacy and create a discipline of knowledge translation geared to taking science to practice. But in our everyday lives, we all love a good story. We all perk up our ears when someone talks about the case they saw last night, the medical legal file they reviewed, and attendance at M&M rounds, morbidity mortality rounds where we review cases, actually official storytelling time. Attendance is always better than at research rounds. The good story, and therefore the good storyteller, has great power to impact and influence people. So in many ways, learning to tell good stories, teaching how to tell them, is a fundamental skill for practitioners, educators, and leaders at all levels. But it's not easy or intuitive. We have to tell the story well, and crucially, draw the right lesson. And if you're good at it, you could become as influential and famous as Atul Gawande, or maybe even Dr. Phil. Another Phil, Phil Jackson, said, the strength of the team is each individual member. The strength of each member is the team. I'm blessed to have great colleagues and friends on my team, and my posse tonight includes my trainer, my dentist, my accountant, my optometrist. And I bet this one is unique. Even my grade three teacher is here. Lorraine, give him a wave. Where's Lorraine? If she looks young, it's because she was only 12 when she was teaching me. <laughs> I'm delighted and grateful that so many of my personal friends are here today, including friends and allies from the public service, Toronto Paramedic Services in Orange, Access to Care at Cancer Care Ontario, colleagues in emergency medicine from around the city and other disciplines. Most directly related today for anyone, anyone who has ever seen my desk, getting me organized and engaged to the task of applying for promotion was no small feat. So Eric, Shirley, Lynn, you all encouraged and assisted me, thank you. And Marie Lieberman, Susan Borgenvag, Sharona, you helped me organize, many thanks to all of you. Eric and his assistant Hirsch organized this reception this evening, my sincerest thanks for that. Lynn, as family medicine department chair, has been a great supporter of emergency medicine. And Eric has been a friend, colleague, mentor, and inspiration to me since 1982, when he recruited me. For a long time, we were co-directors at Sinai and shared a 90-square-foot office, and I don't think we ever argued over space once or anything else. He's always had a firm moral compass I could rely on in challenging times. Thank you, Eric. Emergency medicine is the ultimate team sport, and while good care will always require competent individuals, that's not sufficient. Proper infrastructure, systems and protocols, and even public policies and incentives aligned with desired outcomes create the environment where good care can thrive consistently. I've tried to create that kind of environment for Mount Sinai, ED, and more generally, but I've also been aided myself by the environment I work in and the team around me. My career and its success has been intimately tied to the success of our program, and there are many people and factors I'd like to acknowledge that contributed to that success. I've had great support from the hospital and our board, from our consultant colleagues, and I especially want to thank and acknowledge Joe Mappa, who's been a particular mentor, friend, and supporter of me personally. Under Joe's leadership, not only has the ED thrived and grown, but if you know him, he's a mensch. And as CEO, he sets the tone for the organization overall, which has a wonderful, warm, and welcoming environment, the importance of which can't be underestimated. Because if we want staff to give humane and compassionate care, we have to treat them with decency and respect also. 
Today, he's brought Mount Sinai to a crossroads. The creation of the Sinai Health System will bring wonderful new opportunities. I only wish I was 20 years younger, so I'd be involved in the adventure a little longer. <laughs> Our community plays a very special role, not just with their generosity, but with their questions, ideas, and even expectations. Larry and Judy Tenenbaum are an example of part of that community. They made a little do known donation 10 years ago that let it, allowed me to support a young star, David Dushensky, to become our quality improvement lead. As a result, Dave's now an expert at developing order sets and protocols and other tools of practice that ensure consistency and quality in our work. They're warm, welcoming people. They made a special effort to be here tonight. I'm very honored you're here. Thank you. There are others who are here who are part of our community, including the amazing guys I met on the Kilimanjaro climb. Each of them was so successful in their own careers and so dedicated to the hospital, it was really amazing. The leader of the pack was never in doubt. Among a group of very alpha males, we all knew that David C. stood for captain, not cinnamon. Watching him in action alone was worth the effort of the climb, but he's also supported the ED financially. And his donation, along with that of my old friend David Morrison, have among other things allowed me to support one of our future stars, Catherine Varner, to get her master's degree and launch her research career. And David's, I promise the return on investment will be stupendous. I'm delighted so many of the Kilimanjaro guys are here tonight. You've all been generous with your friendship as well as with your support. I look forward to sharing cigars together very soon. In the 90s, money was tight and Mike Harris was the guy who said he was going to stop the gravy train. At that time, there were four emergency departments on University Avenue within a golf shot of each other. There was a lot of concern we would be forced to integrate. The Mount Sinai ED at the time had good staff, gave good care, and offered good teaching. But we were low volume, low profile, and in an old physical plant, and so we were vulnerable. Somehow we would survive the restructuring report with our independence intact. Not long after, I learned that a guy on our board named Jerry Everyone always called him Jerry. There was apparently only one Jerry. And amazingly, there's also only one Heather. And they made a large donation to rebuild our department. I later learned that their motivation was truly visionary. If Mount Sinai needed to be independent to realize its mission, it needed an emergency department to maintain community access and a relationship with its donor base. The hospital had to be there for its supporters in their time of greatest need 24 hours a day and that meant that it needed an ED. And if the ED was bigger, better, and more important, no one would ever consider closing it. In the 16 years since I met Jerry and Heather and came to understand their vision, we've basically had one long conversation. It consists mostly of Jerry trying to make me think big and of me telling him, we can't think quite that big. But I also tell him that we can grow and do better, and we have. I've also told them that part of the way to do better is by fulfilling our academic mission as well as our clinical and humanitarian mission. It is our mission, actually, given our advantages, no blessings, I think it's our obligation to advance our discipline through the pursuit of research and new knowledge and the education of the next generation in better and more effective ways. The dividends are multiplied because an exciting academic program attracts the best and brightest to work and train with us ensures our own patients are always getting the best of care available. Jerry, always, as always, did his due diligence of our concepts and plans, including memorably for us, having me bring the entire team down to his office for a meet and greet. And the exciting result of that discussion is his renewed investment in our future, an even bigger, better emergency center to care for patients safely and efficiently for another generation, and a unique concept, an emergency medicine institute dedicated to the academic vision. The combination of some secure base funding, a complementary relationship with a major community hospital, strength in new media, ensures we will have lasting and widespread impact, impact on further improving emergency care in ways we can no more imagine today than I could have predicted when I was a student back in 1977. But I'm sure we will preserve the vision of the ED as a sanctuary that offers comfort and compassion along with the latest evidence-based care. I only wish I was 20 years younger so I'd be able to be involved a little longer, but under the leadership of people like Bug and Shirley, I think you will have many great stories to tell. I want to save the last few words for my friends and family. 
That includes my extended family, the people I work with. ER work is truly teamwork. You build deep bonds across years of shared success and tragedy, farce and chaos, sharing holidays, weekends, and nights together. Now, I know my colleagues are thinking, nights? What's he talking about? He doesn't do nights anymore. But you have to understand that Emerge is the only profession where they think if you go home at 3 in the morning after an 18-hour day instead of staying all night, you're dogging it. <laughs> but you do become very close in the ER, and we're family. We've supported each other through tribulations and th celebrations, through simchas and tragedies, and I love you all. <coughs> I love you all. <laughs> um, I'm not finished. Sorry. What's the incubation period for Ebola? My throat's a little sore. <laughs> Don't be nervous. Don't be nervous. I've said repeatedly I'm a lucky guy. If you haven't met my beautiful and charming girlfriend, Julie, you know why I say that. She's bright, charming, and most important, patient. She has to be. Please go and introduce yourself if you've never met her before. I've only got one sister. Gail and her husband, Joe, are here tonight. They were very close to my late wife, Martha, and have been an unbelievable friend and support to me and my kids personally and professionally. I would say my kids are my proudest accomplishment, but that would be arrogant. I don't think any of us truly know how our kids turn out the way they do, but somehow my girls have become brilliant, beautiful, idealistic, and resilient young women who are truly my best friends. In terms of formula for success, according to Charles Schultz, a good education is the next best thing to a pushy mother. <laughs> he meant it as a compliment to mothers everywhere. My mother has always been a loving, supportive, comforting, and pushy mother in only the best ways. Mom, I'm so glad you're here with us. Now, Don Milady would certainly counsel me that our elders should always get the most respect. So with that, I'll shut up and hope, ask you to join me for a drink. Thanks for your patience. Wonderful. Can I say something? David Morrison from the TV specifically in recognition of the promotion of Dr. Howard Howard. <laughs> I invite anybody here to follow my degree in accordance with your needs. <laughs> Howard, I just want to take this opportunity on behalf of the Mount uh, Sinai Emerge Physicians. We have a little gift for you. Um, boy, I didn't do it. I didn't do it with the Mount Sinai You're a source of inspiration and leadership to all of us. I have to share with you, I was at a national conference today, and your name was mentioned several times. They said, oh, you're going to have a professor in dress? Oh, I'm going to share with you a Howard is So there's a new word in the dictionary. So please yes, inspire us with your name. Thank you so much.